Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome everyone to those in the audience. If you could take a seat, that would be great. There's still folks arriving, but we're really pleased to have you in person here at this event. And also welcome to the people that are tuning in at home. Um, I'm Kaylee Ober, the Senior Program Officer of the Climate, Environment, and Conflict Program at the US Institute of Peace. Um, very first thing I'd like to do is take a moment to acknowledge the land in which we're meeting on. Um, Today, this land was the land of the Nanushik and Piscataway people, the first residents of the land that would become the District of Columbia. Um, but where you're sitting today is also the United States Institute of Peace. Um, there's many familiar faces in the room, but for those who don't know, USIP is a national nonpartisan independent institute founded by Congress and dedicated to the proposition that a world without con violent conflict is possible, practical, and essential for the US and global security. Now, the Climate, Environment, and Conflict Program is a relatively new program established in 2020 uh, to understand how climate policy and peace building can work together to ensure that we stay ahead of the climate curve and put effective communities on the path toward long-term peace and stability. Uh, our program actually has three pillars of work, which include climate migration and displacement issues. We just recently issued a PeaceWorks on um, climate migration and, and cities. I encourage you to check that out. We also work on risks related to the just green transition, including um, the race for critical minerals, for instance. And we also focus on transboundary water and conflict issues, um, perhaps why you're here today. Uh, we're particularly interested in understanding how research meets practice. Um, and we have new work undergoing to understand the effective effectiveness of conflict resolution mechanisms in transboundary water agreements. And thanks to a partnership with our learning evaluation and research team, uh, we have something undergoing about how to understand why and how data sharing leads to trust building and water diplomacy. And of course, we're also interested in the impacts of gender on water diplomacy issues. And so today, we're here in honor of the International Day for Women in Diplomacy, which uh, just last year with the leadership of Amina J. Mohammed, the UN Deputy Secretary General, the UN General Assembly declared by consensus uh, that June 24th in a few days time would be the International Day for Women in Diplomacy. Um, and so this coming 24th will be the first anniversary. Uh, the intent of the day is clear, uh, to recognize often overlooked contributions of women in diplomacy and advocate for increased representation of women in key decision-making positions that can greatly shape and implement multilateral agendas. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't also note that today is World Refugee Day and acknowledge that one of our speakers is speaking from her experience as both a woman water diplomat and as a refugee in Canada. Um, we're also interested in women and water diplomacy specifically. Why? Uh, research shows that including women in peace processes uh, makes agreements more durable and leads to lower instances of conflict. But despite this, less than 10% of negotiators in peace processes are women. And in transboundary water management, women are specifically underrepresented, especially at higher levels of decision making. However, entities such as the Women in Water Diplomacy Network are looking to change this by supporting a community of practice focused on empowerment, peer to peer learning, and collective advocacy for formal and informal women water diplomats. Um, we'll be learning more about their work very shortly. But I'd like to first thank them, the Women in Water Diplomacy Network, as well as the Environmental Law Institute and the Stockholm International Water Institute, uh, who support the Women in Water Diplomacy Network for being our co-hosts today. Um, and now, I'd like to turn to our keynote speaker, Mr. Hank W.J. Ovink, the Special Envoy for International Water Affairs of the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Hank was appointed by the Cabinet of the Netherlands as the first Special Envoy for International Water Affairs in 2015. Prior to this role, he was Sherpa to the high-level panel on water, installed by the then UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon and President of the World Bank, Jim Kim. He was both Acting Director General of Spatial Planning and Water Affairs and Director of National Spatial Planning for the Netherlands. Hank is also currently the principal of Rebuild by Design, the resilience innovation competition he developed and led for President Obama's Hurricane Sandy Rebuilding Task Force. And he holds a research position at the University of Groningen and teaches at the London School of Economics and at Harvard Graduate School of Design. Hank, the stage is yours. Thank you so much. 
uh, actually, uh, it's a, a bit weird to be a uh, uh, first speaker as a man. Uh, um, so I uh, uh, dedicate this uh, for sure to my mother, who was a true activist. Uh, she passed away 12 years ago yesterday. So uh, that uh, brought memories, of course, like she's with me every day. Um, but she was um, born in 1926. And post-World War II, one of the first female school directors in the Netherlands. So she was a real powerhouse. So uh, I'd like to honor her with my talk and the many uh, women around the world that have the opportunity, but also take the capacity uh, to lead. Uh, not everybody has, uh, of course. Um, it's not that we all are born in equal opportunities. <clears throat> and we know that, for sure, women are not vulnerable, uh, but find themselves too often in conditions that make them vulnerable. Uh, conditions that predominantly are created by people like me, white male, global north. Uh, I don't feel guilty uh, in that sense personally, but there is definitely a change, uh, a curve that needs to happen. So humility and honor. And thank you, uh, Women, Water and Diplomacy, uh, and Elizabeth, uh, and the whole team for inviting me here. Um, there is a reason, I guess, that you invited me. And that has to do with uh, the UN 2023 Water Conference, a conference that just happened in March this year, 46 years after the first UN conference. Uh, this was the second time in the context of the United Nations that the world had the opportunity to come together. And the government of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, uh, together with the Republic of Tajikistan, were the proud co host of such a process. Uh, so I'd like to talk about uh, four things in my uh, uh, little uh, address. One is, of course, water. Second is women leadership. Third is diplomacy. Uh, not a surprise. But fourth is the alternative. Uh, and uh, let's see if I get there. Um, meanwhile, I brought uh, images from a dear friend, uh, female documentary photographer, Cynthia van Elk, New York-based, uh, who traveled with me and the many partners through Asia while we were doing a, a water program on building capacity in communities in Chennai in India, Kulna in Bangladesh and Samarang in Indonesia. And she documented the whole process. Uh, and the images you see also show uh, the, the, the many sides of the situation. Water vulnerability yeah, here in uh, uh, Kulna. Uh, uh, and then water responsibility, fully uh, depending on women leadership in these communities. And of course, that in itself immediately poses a challenge, because eh? uh, it should not be the burden uh, of women in these communities. Eh? There should be fresh water available uh, for everybody, which is not the case. I don't need to remember you that over 2 billion people around the world lack access to safe drinking water, over 3 billion access to hygiene facilities, and over 4 to sanitation facilities. So. And this burden is predominantly felt by women around the world. But they also take literally the helm uh, and ensure that water is there for their families, for their communities, eating away hours in their days that they should not put in getting water for their communities, but you know, working on their economies, on their communities, on spurring actions across. And science and practice prove that the moment that happens, when there's water available, women lead. They outperform men. They spur these communities towards progress and opportunities for their kids. Girls can go to school with sanitation facilities, then they don't become monthly dropouts. So while the images are amazing, and Cynthia was able to capture here in Chennai the way women lead on water, it also shows that this, you know, this power 
that women bring in securing water for all and securing health for their communities and family is not the situation uh, that we want to see. Water, just asking we're in the Institute of Peace on Diplomacy, who of you has any clue about water? It's like, no, so, that's great. Because uh, <laughs> water is a, is a crazy resource. You know, it's almost free. It's not like oil or energy. Uh, we take it for granted. Predominantly, it's dealt with, with by engineers, predominantly also male engineers. Uh, you focus on infrastructure, yeah? pipes, or fixing the pipes. And almost everything in life is dependent on it. Yeah? It's a human right. Because of that, it's not a commodity. So we pay nothing for the single resource that actually makes us live. Interesting huh? that the thing that's most important for food security, for energy security, for climate, for resiliency, for sustainability, but also for equity and equality, for finance and funding, that single resource water that is connected literally to every sustainable development goal is almost free. And that we literally have no clue how to organize ourselves because it's so complex. It's related to everything. And something that is so complex, related to everything and costs nothing, of course, you know, is left unaccounted for. Right now, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get to our next topic, right now, we put such a large dent into the water cycle, a cycle where we have water in our grounds, in our rivers and lakes and oceans, and in our skies, that that cycle starts to break. And that means that every second of every day, we have less fresh water available for us. While the demand on that fresh water is growing because of population and economic growth. So what we have is a resource unprotected, unaccounted and undervalued, that is abused, misused and undermanaged. Less fresh water means more pollution, less water in our soil. And these are aquifers, groundwater or bubbles, you could say, that beyond a tipping point will not restore themselves. And that is the current situation with close to over half of those aquifers. Water is becoming more saline and more polluted, leaving us more vulnerable. That is one. The second is we have more water in our skies atmospheric rivers, they called, because of, again, pollution, land degradation, infrastructure planning, urbanization, economic development, exacerbated by climate change. So right now, atmospheric rivers are impacting across continents from the Amazon to Africa, from Asia to Europe, from the Americas to China. The environment in the conditions and economies and communities that are already vulnerable. So, a lack of water in one leads to a massive abundance in the other. And on top of that, sea level rise, surges, storms, and droughts, extreme events are becoming more extreme. Over 90% of all those climate disasters hit us through water. So, this crazy little resource that we like to drink. Don't drink it from a bottle, you can drink it from a tap, especially here in the US. Uh, that resource that we take for granted, that you know, until this day, ministers of agriculture and the food industry say, give us our water, because then we give you our food. They don't care for as real water stewards. Private sector and public sector have a hard time getting their head around. That was the whole idea behind this crazy UN water conference, 46 years after, knowing that in contrast to climate or biodiversity, there is no agreement on water. There's nothing to hold ourselves accountable to, so it's only about our voluntary actions and commitments. The conference put together over 800 of those commi commitments, adding up to billions of dollars that now have to be implemented and scaled. At the same time, organizing a conference, well, organizing a conference in the UN is something completely different. We can do that over drinks, uh, but organizing a conference, eh, and I had the honor to lead that on behalf of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, 
organizing a conference in a situation where there's no agreement is also a bit of a cover-up. Because everybody for months, actually years, is very busy with this conference. And it feels like everybody's very busy with water. But it turns out that's not the case. Eh? It's the moment that brings you together. But if there is no follow-up process, if there is no agreement and alignment, the day after the conference you wake up, and I woke up and we warned the world that exactly that Saturday, again, there is nothing organized on water. Nobody picks up the phone at the UN or in the many institutions to organize yourself on water. So water is left alone in a very vulnerable place. Luckily enough, we're here in the US where the United States launched its water security strategy last summer, coming from the White House in partnership with state, USAID, Interior Affairs, the NSC, and so forth, organizations of the US federal government that said, water can't be left alone. It is connected to everything we value, and therefore security is not only security at large, it's security for food, for equity and equality, for finance, for production, for uh, uh, energy, for climate, for cities, the environment, and so forth. I wish more countries would champion water in such a comprehensive way and be able to lead. Uh, the Netherlands was very lucky to work together closely still until this day, not only in the preparation of the conference, being the US one of the co-leads, co-chairs of one of the interactive dialogues on the follow-up of the conference, but also a real push now in the multilateral domain to ensure water is there. And they did this with female leadership. Uh, of course. Uh, um, so that's water. I'm a water ambassador, envoy for the Kingdom of the Netherlands. I stop talking about water because I can never stop talking about water. <laughs> the relationship with women is clear from different angles. It's the leadership question, the capacity, the understanding, but definitely also the value. And we come from a time where we thought every problem could be solved with a solution, which is a, you could say, a very modernistic view on the world. And with all those solutions that we poured out around the world, we created many, many more problems that all were then again attributed with more solutions. IPCC now counts that 90, over 99% of all global investments, I will repeat this, over 99% percent of all global investment increases climate change, one, and second, makes us more vulnerable because it destroys exactly that that actually can help us in the context of sustainability, equity, and climate. And that means that the way we invest, eh, the way our policies are drafted, the way we value and validate uh, our programs and projects are designed and tailored to something that is totally outdated single-focused, non-inclusive, non-comprehensive, and not addressing the longer term. And those mechanisms, uh, 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 of course, were designed predominantly by men in the positions that they led, and I don't want to put the blame totally on them, but we have to change course. Looking up literature, will women leadership change that course? Don't think so, not by itself. Uh, but in collaboration, in inclusion, and through the lenses of valuing equity, sustainability, and resiliency, we can. And shown is there that we have a massive gap to bridge. And also around the world, we see wherever we put the opportunity in place for women to lead, they are able to bridge many of these gaps. Uh, it takes a village to develop the change that we need. Uh, and that village can and should be co-run by women in leadership position. Third is diplomacy uh, and the way how we come together. Now, we're in the Institute of Peace and Diplomacy, so you know more about diplomacy than myself. I know it by practice, working in regions of the world where there are conflicts, where water is a key driver uh, a source as part of those tensions uh, and where we can overcome this. 
by coming together. Now, how can water and diplomacy hold hands? Again, that is, I would say, almost more, you know, fairly easy. The opportunity with water is that it touches upon everything. So that means that if you have an honest conversation on the issues at stake, and you start with water, because water is linked literally to everything, it's also linked to everyone. Everyone has a stake. And that means with everyone having a stake, everyone also has a role. Water conversations organized in a very safe manner, a safe space, really help to address issues way beyond water security. They tap into opportunities for women and kids, for resiliency and economy, for environmental issues, for food and energy security, for schools, educations, and jobs. Water conversations empower diplomacy around the world, if done in the best way possible. So diplomacy informed through a water lens helps us understand what a conversation can really look like that is inclusive, that is addressing holistically the issues at stake, and goes beyond the lock-in we too often find in the context where we need diplomacy so most. Not saying that water will solve all your problems. Uh, in the wrong hands, it will only make them worse. Uh, but in the right hands, uh, women hands, water diplomacy can really help us understand better the challenges, the interdependencies, and the opportunities that come with it. And that's to the last point, which are, uh, is the alternative. If 99%, over 99% of our global investments, and therefore the way we are tailoring our economies is increasing our vulnerability, our inequalities, and increasing climate change, how can we turn that 1% where we get our inspiration from into 2, 4, 16, and a majority? What is the safe space needed to bring forces together to ensure that that alternative of looking at the future and not the past bypassing our lock-ins and coming together really can spur the action so much needed and empower the, the sitting powers to step beyond their vested interests. I don't know. If I did, we wouldn't have this challenging conversation because if I know, you know, right? Uh, I'm no magician. Uh, I'm a Dutch diplomat uh, working on water. But I do know from working on water in places like Chennai, Gaza, Afghanistan, Peru, Chile, the US, New York after Hurricane Sandy, Europe, Africa, Central Asia, in all those places where vulnerability of our future and future generations is at the heart of the opportunity of solving a crisis, that it is possible, that there is always a will, if only we dare to look it into eyes and empower it. I started with my mother, who was a true activist. Uh, I'll end with my father, who was married to her uh, for a very long time. He turned 97 when he passed away in 2018, uh, five years ago now. Um, they were two of the same kind, in a way true activist, but my father was an engineer, and not the bully type of engineer like Robert Moses, but a passionate engineer. Uh, when I worked for President Obama, we had a joke. If Robert Moses and Jane Jacobs had married, their love babies might have been able to, you know, change the world in a very compassionate, passionate, inclusive, human-centric, community-led way, still building bridges and infrastructure that was resilient and taking into account. I'm not saying my parents would have been that ideal match for the world. Uh, I don't think uh, idealism comes to play here. But I do believe that putting together the will and capacity for an inclusive, equitable, and very holistic approach can come together with the action needed to deliver the change in the communities for our economies and 
our political environments that we so much need. And I think it's exactly why we are here. And I wish you a great conference. I want to thank you for your attention. I don't love following that speech. I mean, it was very inspiring, and I'm sure we're all feeling very inspired right now. So thank you so much, Hank. That was truly moving. And thank you to your mother, and incidentally, your father, for, for inspiring all of us. Um, so I'm actually here to just introduce our moderator, who will have the task of introducing the rest of our panelists. Uh, so it's my great pleasure to introduce Elizabeth uh, Koch, the Senior Manager for International Programs at the Environmental Law Institute, and the lead of the Women in Water Diplomacy Network's process support team. She has over 15 years of experience supporting water diplomacy engagements in conflict-sensitive basins on behalf of ELI, Seaweed Shared Waters Partnership Program, the UNESCO Category 2 International Center for Water Cooperation, and Eco Peace Middle East. I'm sure there's many more things that can be said, but Elizabeth, please, the stage is yours. Welcome to you all. It's such a pleasure to see uh, mostly new faces uh, in the room today. My name is Elizabeth. Um, indeed, it's been my pleasure to support the Women in Water Diplomacy Network since 2017, first through the Stockholm International Water Institute and now here in the United States for the Environmental Law Institute. Um, I really just want to say a big thank you to our partners of this event, the USIP, this beautiful auditorium, uh, and our partners from the Stockholm International Water Institute as well. Um, before I introduce our amazing panelists today, I'm going to just give a few minutes, uh, a little background on the Women in Water Diplomacy Network so you all can get a sense of this community that goes uh, many, uh, spread across several continents these days. So, we like to refer to the background of the network as the her story of the network. Uh, so we can do a little bit of uh, sharing of our inception and development periods since 2017. Um, you're going to hear from several network members uh, in the panel as well, who I hope can give you a taste of their experience as part of the network. Um, I should say that the network really, what, why did we dive into this uh, network development stage? Well, uh, my colleagues at CWE and I, we had the opportunity through the State Department supported Shared Waters Partnership Program, together with the Netherlands and UNDP and Sweden have supported a net, uh, engagements in conflict sensitive river basins all around the world, predominantly in Africa and Central Asia and the Middle East. And these engagements enabled us to provide support, opportunities for joint learning, planning with riparian stakeholders from across these basins. And what we saw again and again was that the lead actors in those decision-making forums uh, were men, and there was a kind of a sense of exclusion already there. So in addition to what we call mainstreaming gender equality throughout our programming, we also said, okay, we also need to do targeted engagement to bring more women uh, water diplomats into this room, into the decision-making space, um, and hold hands with us throughout that process. So. In 2017, an uh, amazing group of women water diplomats from across the Nile Basin got together for the very first time. And we had no idea that a Women in Water Diplomacy Network was going to be formed at that time. Uh, but we brought together representatives of the Ministries of Water and Ministries of Foreign Affairs from the Nile Basin countries. Uh, and this was really the first time that we had this opportunity and we took five days together to learn together, exchange knowledge, talk about some of the core issues in the Nile Basin that of, of the day, um, get to know each other's experience, how did they become a women water diplomat, and also just uh, give everyone the sense that they are a women water diplomat. It's often one of our key messages in the network is that you are a water diplomat, and you are a water diplomat, and you are a water diplomat. Uh, and that was really one of the core uh, aspects of that first workshop. A, a little more than a year later, we brought together the, the group 
Uh, they, at that point, they said, we need to do this every year. We have to bring in new people to the network. We want to establish a constant engagement. And so we launched the second Women in Water Diplomacy Network Forum, which took place in Ethiopia at the end of 2018. And again, five days together, experience exchange, networking. Uh, there was a lot of uh, major political issues on the table in the Nile in this time period. Uh, we had uh, lead negotiators from Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, uh, the, the Great Lakes region of the Nile. It was really a fantastic opportunity. And while we did something like a several day simulation of negotiation on a fictitious basin, we were able to bring some of those core issues into the discussion um, in, a, in a safe space between a sisterhood of diplomats. The third Nile Network Forum was held in January 2020. Uh, this took place in Kenya. Uh, it was, again, an amazing opportunity for learning. We brought in a, quite a few younger water diplomats in that, uh, in that uh, forum event. Uh, and you can see already there's a sense of real uh, sisterhood across this network um, and really outstanding opportunity really just to get to know each other. You'll note January 2020 is we, we had a, a bit of a change up thereafter. Um, as so many communities across the world experienced, we as well had to very much pivot our engagements uh, to online digital water diplomacy supported engagements. So whereas before we were meeting in person every year, now we were meeting online almost on a monthly basis. And while of course it was a really difficult period for many of our network members um, all, around the, all around the Nile Basin who lost uh, family members or really had to battle through some difficult times, it also enabled us to come together in a really difficult time. We uh, learned how to do these online engagements all together uh, and we did it at such a higher frequency that we were able to handle new challenges across our growing network. The next year was the year that we launched the Central Asia Afghanistan Network. Uh, you can imagine trying to launch such a community of practice in a time when uh, in-person meetings were not possible was a real challenge, um, but we were able to bring them together. Each of the representatives in this network were nominated by their countries. Um, and you're going to meet uh, one of our Afghan representatives in the panel discussion just shortly. Um, it was a very difficult year to launch a process in Central Asia and Afghanistan, as you can imagine. And things immediately changed for so many of our network members as uh, the Taliban uh, took over in Afghanistan. Uh, still, the network continued to meet online, discuss, exchange, and support each other through this very difficult time. Um, that same year, we launched the Women in Water Diplomacy Leadership Council, and you can see some of the amazing members uh, representing their country or their institutions uh, that have been really leading this network since its inception. Uh, so you have very senior representatives from a number of the Nile Basin countries, as well as Southern Africa, uh, Iswatini, and South Africa here today. Um, you saw one of these publications outside the room. We have lots of copies, so please take some and uh, d dive on into our strategy. There's other uh, publications that can give you further background on the network online, um, or just write me an email and I can tie you over to those uh, resources. Um, in 2022, we went global. When we launched the strategy that's out on the table outside, uh, we really said we have a blueprint that is adaptable and adoptable uh, to basins all over the world. We've given it a go in the Nile, Central Asia and Afghanistan, sisters in the Americas and Asia, Southeast Asia were reaching out to us saying, hey, we want uh, to grow networks in our basin communities. So we had a global network forum that's brought together about 75 women water diplomats from a lot around the world, a couple of uh, representatives right here in the room. 
Uh, and we came together for a few days of learning, and then we launched our strategy at the World Water Week in Stockholm, Sweden. And that was also just a really uh, unique experience for many of us to come together and meet people engaged in similar professional capacities from very different contexts. And then as Hank uh, elevated, we had a chance to participate most recently in the UN Water Conference. We had a side event uh, that was inside the UN and we had a one day water diplomacy uh, symposium ourselves. Again, we tried to bring together around 70 water diplomats, men and women this time, uh, to explore some of the you know, wicked challenges around water diplomacy. Uh, of the day and come then come to the UN Water Conference with a real motivation to elevate issues of gender equality within the water uh, dialogues taking place at the UN. This is our network strategy. I really just encourage you to look through it uh, in detail. I will just say that it's generally built around five pillars. Uh, gender and youth empowerment is the first one where we really work with um, women to empower them, young diplomats to encourage their entry into the sector, male champions that want to support uh, the network and make space for women water diplomats in their worlds. Peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning is our modus operandi really of the network. We have so much capacity in the network, so much knowledge and experience. It's really about making space to uh, and accessing that knowledge. We're also uh, trying to get a research cooperation agenda off the ground. Uh, you, you can see in the literature there are not as many uh, women engaged in research processes in these networks uh, either. And that, those researchers in many countries become very important influential intermediaries in, in diplomatic processes, bringing their knowledge to those discussions. And finally, events like this, uh, where we're engaging with the public, uh, elevating messages, uh, coming to conferences and whatnot. Pillar five is really about organizations like ELI and CWE who support the network. Uh, and we do monitoring evaluation, resource mobilization, and that kind of thing to support the objectives identified by the Leadership Council and the strategy. We have a lot of partners. Some of them are here today, so very much thank you to the Netherlands and the US State Department who are with us in the room today. Um, also, Sweden and UNDP, our partners in Central Asia include the Organization for Cooperation and Security, or Cooperation and Security in Europe, uh, and the Central Asia Regional Environmental Center, uh, who is our local partner really driving this process in Central Asia and Afghanistan, and a number of institutional partners that have been helping us along the way. Uh, we're really grateful to you all. We really believe that we're a community that's stronger together. And so we look for opportunities to collaborate and uh, with complementary expertise along the journey. That is it for me. I have the very lovely opportunity to introduce an extremely, uh, I mean, a wealth of experience in this panel. Uh, their bios are available in full on the website. I will introduce each one and ask them to join me on the stage here. Um, we do hope to have opportunities for some questions and answers after some of our own uh, questions uh, have an opportunity to be responded to. So if, if something comes to your mind, please get ready to hold your hand up during the open discussion. So, First of all, I'd like to welcome to the stage Tanya Tuhilo. Tanya uh, is the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the U.S. Department of Interior. She's been an amazing champion of the network these last years, joining us uh, in events in Stockholm, uh, at the U.N., and a number of other different locations. She has, is a water lawyer with really more than 30 years of experience working in complex natural resource management uh, issues. 
Um, she most recently worked, on, worked as a project director for the Colorado River Sustainability Campaign, and before that was the executive director of the Colorado River Board of California. She has served as senior counsel to the US Energy and Natural Resources Committee and as counselor to the Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the Department of Interior. Welcome, Tanya. Um, next to her is Dr. Annalise Bloom. Uh, and Dr. Bloom is a hydrologist with experience in climate, water, national security policy. Uh, she served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Water and Science at the U.S. Department of Interior, working really closely with the U.S. Geological Survey and the Bureau of Reclamation. Previously, she served at the DOD, the Department of Defense, as a Senior Advisor for Climate Policy and an American Association for Advancement of Science Policy Fellow, um, for which she was awarded the Office of the Secretary of Defense Medal for Exceptional Public Service. Dr. Bloom has over a decade of experience leading multidisciplinary research focused on water security, extreme events, and the impact of climate change. Welcome very much, Dr. Bloom. Online, you're gonna meet very shortly uh, Fumin Furo. Uh, Fumin is one of our founding network members from Afghanistan. Uh, she holds an MSc in hydraulics uh, from Ferdowski University and until recently served as the general director of the Kabul River Basin Authority. This is the largest water basin in Afghanistan. Uh, and, before, and of course, uh, when the Taliban took over Kabul, all women professionals were no longer able to undertake their professional roles, including Fumin. So since that time, she's relocated to our neighbor in Canada, uh, where she's now serving as a water resource specialist and engineer at the South Nation Conservation Authority. Fuman has extensive experience in transboundary water management, serving in various capacities at the Afghan ministry, including actor, acting director for water allocation, dam and river advisory, uh, she participated and in some cases led negotiations with all of Afghanistan's neighbors uh, and she's really been an essential leader in the development of the network in Central Asia. Whew, these are long, they're it's just so impressive. Uh, my dear, dear friend, Dr. Zodwa de la Mini, uh, is a seasoned international transboundary water management specialist a development professional and senior infrastructure project manager. Uh, she was the former South African chief delegate uh, and permanent representative on the Lesotho Highlands Water Commission for 11 years. Uh, she oversaw the, this major infrastructure work. It, it, until very recently, it was the largest water infrastructure project in Africa. Uh, and so she played an enormous role in sustainable development issues in that region. Uh, Zodwa further led and really championed gender policies, uh, gender equality policies in that basin in a really intense, uh, intentional and decisive manner, uh, hiring in the end the first appointed women chief uh, executive officer for the basin. Um, and she was a founding member of the Women in Water Diplomacy Network in the Nile, been with us since that very first picture in Uganda, uh, and a, just a, a pleasure to work closely with. And finally, Dr. Aubrey Paris uh, is a senior policy advisor on gender, climate change, and innovation in the Secretary's Office of Women, Global Women's Issues at the US Department of State, where she leads foreign policy and public diplomacy efforts related to the nexus of gender and climate change. At the State Department, she launched the Innovation Station, uh, initiative to amplify the impact of women and girl innovators, developing solutions to climate-related challenges, while also drawing uh, subnational connections between the domestic uh, policy objectives and international communities. Prior to joining the State Department, Dr. Paris was a National Science Foundation Research Fellow and Energy and Climate Scholar at Princeton, where she contributed to research projects on water security, among many other issues. So, uh, dear panelists, I invite you all to the stage. Uh, wow, it's such a pleasure to have you all with us. <laughs> I 
should point out before we get going that you're probably all noticing that we have this lovely clip on. This is the symbol of the Women in Water Diplomacy Network, and it was co-designed by our network just prior to our global strategy launch um, through a really interactive process together with several designers in Sweden. Uh, and so you, you'll see people wearing them here and in other events. Welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to dive right into a discussion. Um, welcome, Fuman, as well. Uh, Let's start with you, Dr. Zodwa. Help us set the scene, if you would. You, we've heard a little bit from Hank on what is a water diplomat, why this is such an important role and opportunity for addressing some of our major security and peace issues of the day. Could you elaborate on your experience of being a water diplomat? What is this water diplomacy, especially for many of the people in the room where this is new? Oh, your microphone is here. Okay. Thank you so much. It's been a, it's, it's such a great opportunity to be here and to discuss this very important uh, subject, which is very close to my heart. And uh, when we talk about water diplomacy, you know, we're talking about inclusive, you know, collaboration of various stakeholders. And these stakeholders will vary from youth, women, indigenous people, politicians, you name it. And the, it is not a fiefdom of exclusive individuals, which has always been you know, uh, the trend in the past. However, when you look at uh, this water diplomacy, it includes everybody because it's about collaboration. Collaboration in terms of what is needed, especially in transboundary waters. The, you know, it's just that one river that we are talking about that everybody is relying on. And that river, as Hank was saying, a lot of times we take it for granted and yet it benefits everybody. Hence, we cannot just say it belongs to a particular group and in the exclusion of others. So it's about inclusivity. But most importantly also, it brings technical you know, expertise as well as political uh, expertise, you name it. It's about technical, informal you know, engagements, as well as formal engagements. You know, so this is exactly what we are talking about and saying, let's bring women together because we know what is important and the role that they will play. We have seen for many, many years, for many decades, where you know, agreements were reached without women. And most of those agreements, when you go to them, law students, when you look at them, there are so many flaws. But some of the, you know, you know, some of these agreements, they need to bring a tinge of the a, a tinge of the future, because most of the time we are not even certain of what the future is holding. So if we are not going to bring in you know, and uh, that foresight and that vision, which will say there might be, you know, a tinge or there might be that climate change. And who would know better? Because women will always know, you know, when the source is no longer, a particular source is no longer producing so much water, it's women who will know first, you know. So it's very, very important that that an inclusivity, that inclusion is always there. Be it youth, because by the way, the future is no longer ours. It's for those we are taking from the, the youth, because it's their future also. And when we talk about you know, uh, women involvement, that for me is very important. There's no way we can do it without 
their, you know, their participation. That we have seen you know, in various uh, uh, basins, especially in the Orange Sinkle, we have seen that, as well as you know, working in the Lesotho Highlands Water Project, you know, involving women even at village level makes sense. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Can you see why she's been a mentor to us all? Um, Tanya, as a senior leader in the Department of Interior, what does diplomacy mean to you? And could you share with us some examples of how you have practiced diplomacy in your 30-year career of being a water lawyer and working on policy issues, including from your current role? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to all the hosts here for having us. Um, in particular, Elizabeth, your leadership at the network has been very inspiring, and it's been wonderful to be part of the group. I am very pleased to be here. I want to follow Hank's lead and perhaps say a thank you to my grandmother and mother, who were, were leaders in diplomacy as well. My grandmother was one of the first Hispanic female graduates from a small college in northern New Mexico, where I'm from, and taught in one-room school houses in northern New Mexico to inspire the next uh, generation after her. And uh, my mother ensured that my brother and I were able to have a great college education and a law school education and allow us to give back to our communities. And I think that's very much the spirit of of diplomacy with respect to how I've approached my career. At, at the department, I think one of my uh, current roles and goals is to be able to encourage and empower the next generation of leadership. And I'm tag teaming today with our Deputy Assistant Secretary, Annalise Bloom, who you, uh, you introduced earlier and really acknowledged the, the great uh, leadership that she will bring to the department and also really encouraging and reminding us of the importance of the role of science in underpowering and underpinning all of our decision making and being the basis for the diplomacy that we have been working on. So it's been great personally to be able to be part of the team at Interior. We have lots of uh, good leadership in place, whether we're working on transboundary issues with Canada or Mexico or throughout the, the global environment that we're in. So thank you very much. And I uh, look forward to hearing from Annalise as this program. Fantastic. Well, I, I'd like to dive into that intersection between policy and science a little bit, Dr. Bloom. Uh, we heard in your intro that you have a wealth of experience as a hydrologist engaging in the water science and data sharing from some of the most contentious basins out there. Um, you're now focusing on policy issues. Could you give us some highlights of about what you think would be important for bringing more women into this uh, space? Sure. Thanks so much. Um, and thank you so much, Assistant Secretary Trujillo. It's great to um, get to work together on these topics. So as a scientist, not surprising, um, I think one of the things that's most important that we focus on is making sure that we have the data and that we're gathering the data, particularly as climate change is making everything more uncertain and more extreme. We need to make sure that we're gathering all of that kind of basic data and we're sharing it with one another so that we can have a common baseline for conversations, whether it's over shared water resources or something else, but having that common understanding I think is really an important first step to be able to make progress on these issues um, and making sure that the, the information is getting to those who need it the most and communities that maybe previously haven't had access to these sort of data sources. And this has um, been a real push from the Biden-Harris administration, making sure our investments are informed by the best data and science. Um, at Department of Interior, I'm lucky to work closely with the U.S. Geological Service Survey or USGS, the nation's earth, water, biology, and civilian mapping agency, and the USGS is playing a really important role in supporting the US, but also the world in providing data um, and understanding and knowledge that can inform all of these sort of discussions. So specific to water, um, we know a common understanding of how much water is available is often kind of this first step to cooperative management. And personally, before my policy um, work, I was a postdoctoral fellow at Johns Hopkins um, and worked with a team we formed we called the Ad Hoc Blue Nile Forecast Group um, 
a team of researchers working outside the region to develop seasonal forecasts. We wanted to inform the conversation on the filling of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam with hopes that we could provide this politically neutral outlook of Upper Nile flows to help inform the discussion. So just kind of personally an example of working on this sort of data. Um, in my policy work at Interior, the Bureau of Reclamation um, recently released their new climate change adaptation strategy that talks about pilots and collaborations to increase the utility of forecast-informed reservoir operations. Again, kind of how we can bring the data in to manage our water resources, particularly in light of climate change. Um, and also, finally, the other kind of key thing, in addition to data I wanted to highlight, is making these interconnections, whether it's between hydrology and social science, whether it's between the security community um, and the scientists or the diplomats. Um, and so previously I worked at DOD, um, and it was really interesting being there at the Department of, US Department of Defense and realizing the work that I had done when I started my career on water sanitation and hygiene or WASH really was a security topic. And that was, I didn't think of it from a security lens when I was doing it, but working at in the security space and understanding kind of the intersection of how all of these issues are important for building security and peace was really fascinating. So I think kind of making sure that we're breaking down these silos and talking to other communities um, is gonna be really key to advancing all the topics we care about. Thanks. Fantastic, wow. Um, Dr. Paris, I, I wonder if you could build on some of those connections between the policy and science and really bring in the gender equality perspective from your current role. Uh, we, we have such an amazingly qualified <laughs> panel here today. Uh, really, the floor is yours, Dr. Paris. Well, thank you so much for the question and for having me. You've convened a really dynamic group here, so congratulations. Um, yeah, I think this this answer really does flow naturally from, from Dr. Bloom's answer, because let's be honest for a moment. As policymakers, the most effective decisions that we can make will be informed by all sorts of topics. It includes economics, it includes geopolitical considerations, it includes social and cultural context, and it should also include science, right? Especially as we're thinking about things like natural resource availability, water scarcity, water excess, et cetera, when we're trying to project into the future to make decisions on things that remain uncertain. We need the best available information. What this really means is um, a two-way street of communication between policymakers and scientists. And this is where I think, like Dr. Bloom, it's really interesting to think uh, with my scientist hat on as well as with a, a policymaker's hat on. Seeing both sides of that conversation or having experienced both sides of that conversation, I think there's a lot of scientists out there who are really, really eager to ensure that the data they generate um, are being considered by people who could use that data productively to make important decisions. And that's something that we see happening more and more in government and decision-making spheres, which is excellent. But we also need the other end of that communication as well. Policymakers need to be able to communicate with scientists about what sorts of data are missing, um, what information they need to make those complete decisions. Um, I think that a lot of the times the data that, that are missing or that I've experienced uh, people really searching for are really the, the data that come from on the ground experiences, the lived experiences of women and girls in these highly climate effective re uh, affected regions. The case studies of what they've experienced that we can also use to make decisions. We at the State Department have kind of generated an internal resource. We have a series called our Ask a Gender and Climate Expert Series where we bring in academics, many US academics who are leading on different topics in the gender and climate space, including water security. And we allow for that two-way conversation, uh, the academics to present their findings, but also for the policymakers to say, but what about this? You know, I, I hear you here, but we're still missing this information to really get those conversations started. It's often those case studies and the on-the-ground examples that we're still missing and we could use more of. Thanks. Wow. 
Wow, thank you. Um, I just, I just want to highlight to all the young people in the room as well, water diplomacy has space for lawyers, hydrologists, scientists, communicators, uh, project managers, all sorts. And it really takes all hands on deck to deal with some of the enormous challenges across the water sector. So I really encourage you to live by this amazing examples and apply your expertise and knowledge to the water sector as we move into this very difficult times ahead. Fumen, welcome. I haven't forgot about you. Um, few in this room can speak to the personal trajectory of, of your life as a water diplomat at, at the fore of some of the most water insecure basins in the world managing uh, Afghan relations, water relations with your neighbors from Pakistan to Iran, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan. You are the former director of Afghanistan's largest transboundary basin. I would just love it if you could share a bit about your experience um, as a senior negotiator. And if you would, you recently wrote an article for the Women in Water Diplomacy's newsletter uh, highlighting you know, the lack of women or water knowledge from Afghanistan at the UN Water Conference, given the enormous changes in the region. Could you reflect on that as well? Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you to give me a chance to speak in the high level uh, uh, conference. Uh, as you know, the Afghanistan major river basin are shared with the uh, neighboring countries. The Kabul River Basin, where I work as a general manager, has been one of the most challenging area in the term of water resource management in the local level and also the regional level between two countries. Because of the climate change, the number of droughts and uh, floods has increased, which has water tension at all levels. In addition, the development project of both country on the upstream and the downstream uh, in the sub in the river basin increased tension and highlighted the issue of water uh, scarcity and transboundary water. In addition to challenge and technical problem I faced in water resource management, I also had to face a serious traditional problem that Afghan society was dealing with. In traditional society of Afghanistan, the presence of a woman as a leader was often disregarded and consistently met with challenges. However, I and other resilient Afghan women refused to give in this limitation and consistently strive to play a significant role in our country development and the manage of water resources. Unfortunately, the progress in women participation in water resource management <clears throat> was abruptly halted with the rise of the Taliban, a fundamentalist group that opposed to women involvement in all aspects of society, culture, and policies. As of one of the senior manager, I was unfortunately forced to remain at home and leave my position. While the challenge of gender inequality and displacement persists, there is immense potential in integrating gender perspective into water management and diplomacy, as well as empowering female water professionals. By involving diverse range of stakeholders, including women, we can make better informed decision, find sustainable solution, and promote equitable water resource management. For women professional working in water resource management who were forcibly displaced from their careers, the situation has had proud profound implication for water management in Afghanistan. Gender inequality and social stereotypes has created specific barriers hindering the professional advancement of women in transboundary water sector. Women water experts often incur challenge in assessing leadership position and face exclusion from decision-making process due to particular structure and political norms. As we know, the presence of women in water resource management yield positive effect for both resource management and communities. These effects include enhanced economic and environmental performance. 
uh, preferments, gender balance and social justice, and improve a sustainable utilization of water resource. To realize this positive outcome, effective policy and measures that prioritize gender in water resource management are crucial, although such initiatives appear unlikely under the current ruling group in Afghanistan. In conclusion, by uh, acknowledging the importance of women partnership and addressing gender-related challenge, we can pave the way for inclusive and sustainable decision-making process in water resource management in Afghanistan. Thank you so much, Fumin. Uh, you're such an inspiration to the network. We're so lucky to have your continued engagement. Um, as many of you know, the network kind of got one of its foundations through something in Sweden called the Feminist Foreign Policy. And Feminist Foreign Policy uh, was conceived in a number of different countries, and over the years it has spread around the world, including uh, to our neighbors here, Canada and Mexico. And it takes different forms in different countries. Um, but Dr. Paris, I'd like to turn back to you, if you would, um, thinking about you know, the foundation of our network in feminist foreign policy. Um, could you share with us some important values and approaches here in the United States, which uh, take into account gender equality at these intersections with climate and water? I would love to. <laughs> so I think first and foremost, it's important to understand the vast complexity of the situation that we're talking about here. What does the nexus of gender equality and climate change actually look like? Well, it has implications, of course, for natural resource availability, food, water, firewood, and, and other resources as well. It has implications for migration and conflict, looking at how women and girls are differentially affected by natural resource scarcity and the conflicts and other outcomes that might occur as a result. We see intersections with gender-based violence, GBV. GBV tends to increase as natural resource scarcity increases, whether that be in the home, if women and girls are seen as unable to accomplish their, their roles and responsibilities related to water or other natural resource procurement. GBV increases on migration routes or in temporary shelters following natural disasters. We also see child early and forced marriages increase when we see families uh, feel the need to reduce their expenses, right, when, as scarcity uh, worsens as well. Educational opportunities, livelihood opportunities, healthcare services are often, uh, they often disappear following natural disasters in ways that explicitly affect women and girls. So a lot of challenges. There's also opportunities though, when we think of the green and blue economies and the jobs that are becoming available in these economies and sectors, as well as any sector transitioning to a, a greener, more sustainable approach. But that, of course, means ensuring that if we want women and girls to be able to take advantage of these opportunities, ensuring they have the education, training, mentorship, assets, financing, you name it, to be able to take advantage of and realize those opportunities. This really big, complex picture, which I could talk about for 20 minutes alone. You're welcome, I won't. Uh, but this complex picture really leads to the U.S. government's two-pronged approach to policy programming and outreach efforts related to the nexus of gender equality and climate change. On the one hand, addressing the disproportionate impacts of the climate crisis on women and girls, and on the other hand, empowering women and girls as leaders in combating the climate crisis. We've fortunately been able to institutionalize this approach in several key gender strategies of the US government, including the US National Strategy on Gender Equity and Equality, the recent update to the US strategy to prevent and respond to gender-based violence globally, which for the first time now does integrate climate change and environmental challenges, including water issues, in our GBV response approach as well as the U.S. strategy uh, on global women's economic security, which was launched um, for the first time ever earlier this year. The last thing that I'll mention before I turn things back over is, is there are many ways to try to put this approach into practice. And one of the ways that we have um, worked on this from the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues is through our Innovation Station Initiative. Really recognizing that women and girls around the world are generating creative 
translatable solutions to these climate-related challenges in their communities. So we're amplifying their work through various online formats, virtual events, podcasts, all the fun stuff, but also helping them behind the scenes to build their networks with other communities domestically and internationally that could learn from their work and implement their solutions elsewhere. Um, so that's sort of part of our empowerment arm of, of that approach and how we're taking action. Oh, that's super inspiring. Um, Dr. Zodwa, when I was introducing you, I mentioned that you are a member of our leadership council and that you've been engaged in supporting the network since 2017. I wonder if you could give a little more character to the herstory stages that I outlined in the intro and your experience as being part of, of that network. As everyone knows, our, our strategy is called the Path Forward for Women, water, peace, and security. And you really bring together all of those different pieces. When we started uh, in, in 2017, we didn't know that uh, this workshop of women uh, was going to develop into a network. We had women who came from all the 11 countries uh, of the Nile, and we, you know, they were from the Ministry of uh, Water as well as Foreign Affairs. But also, we had members of par Parliament who came. And when we first started, a lot of women felt unease. And most of them, they were asking themselves, and they were even articulating it to say they, that they don't think that they are at the right place. And uh, because they did not even understand, they had never even you know, heard the concept of water diplomacy. And uh, you know, there, it, it, there was, a, you know, we had to, with all the other um, support system, you know, ladies that were there, you know, uh, ambassadors from Netherlands, and also uh, uh, ambassadors from, from Sweden who had been working in the, in the, in the area of peace negotiations. And uh, they were, you know, it was like, wow, we have never heard of so, so, you know, so many powerful women who had been negotiating for peace. You know, and then uh, others, uh, my colleagues uh, also uh, from, from ELI, you know, Jennifer, uh, so you, you Jessica, uh, you were look, you know, at that time, you, you could see that there was a thirst to do something, but they did not know how, you know, whether they were the right persons, because they kept on looking at themselves to say, but I'm only a, a, um, an assistant director in the organization. What kind of impact can I make? But the, the long and short of it all, by the third day, everybody felt that they had a, they, you know, they had a, a chance, but also they belonged there. And uh, we started, you know, strategizing, but also giving personal, you know, experiences as we were sharing with them where we came from and what it is that we have been through, you know, and uh, how we are going to assist them to understand their role, you know, and also not to undermine the, the kind of, you know, uh, abilities and experiences that they were going to be bringing. So that made a huge impact. But as we, you know, we continued in, in that, uh, that workshop, you know, 2018, 19, a lot of things happened. But most importantly, which I would want to also share, is that even during the COVID-19 period, as Elizabeth was talking about it, is that most of the people that we are talking about, the women we are talking about, are from areas where you know, connectivity is not a given, it's a challenge. 
and uh, there were times when we would be there, you know, some would be coming in and, uh, you, you know, and then and there would be an interruption. But as uh, Elizabeth said, you know, a lot of them kept on, you know, uh, entering and being there, you know, uh, to be seen, but also to participate. So it was not easy to really build the, net the network. And uh, thanks to women such as Elizabeth Gore, as well as Julian and uh, uh, Alexandra, those were people that kept on the, the ship you know, afloat so that we could achieve what we achieved within that space of time. In that year, 2021, you know, Afghanistan as well as Central Asia, they, a network was born there. And then if, during that very year, you know, um, the leadership council for the Nile Basin was formed. And uh, during that very time, a pathway, our strategy was, uh, uh, was developed. And uh, thanks to the various development partners, as well as various others that assisted in terms of reviewing the strategy, but also, you know, Siwa uh, brought in the element of uh, male champions. That was very, very important because, as Hank said, there's no way that women only can, you know, succeed in diplomatic, you know, missions without men being there. All we are asking for is, you know, equality. Let women also participate because we have a right to be there. We have a right to participate. And that is what we were able to do. And in 2022, we were able to then, you know, um, launch the strategy during the uh, Stockholm World Water Week. And we also held our very first global forum in Stockholm. So that is what this was all about. And this is where we are. And since then, we have been able to continue to hold you know, various workshops you know, uh, that is virtually because we had to adapt. Thank you so much. And I should I should note, uh, yeah, fantastic. Um, Dr. Zodwa is leading the charge on establishing new chapters of the Women in Water Diplomacy Network in uh, Southern African Basin. She mentioned the Ornsenku, uh, the Okavanga, and our dear partners uh, in the Zambezi Commission as well are all really involved these days in the network. And I would be remiss to mention that we're really uh, crossing our fingers and hoping to launch a Canada-US-Mexico uh, network as well with really le strong leadership and anchorage uh, with indigenous women who are taking the charge and leading water diplomacy issues across this region. Um, we're running out of time, so I'm going to uh, skip over to you, Dr. Bloom, and ask you a question on that, uh, that very issue. Uh, President Biden made history in selecting Secretary Deb Holland uh, to be the first Native American Secretary of the Department of Interior. What are some of the steps that have occurred to ensure that indigenous knowledges and viewpoints are part of decision making here? Thanks so much. Oh. Thank you so much for that question. Um, yeah, it's a really big push across the whole Department of Interior um, and broader US government right now to include indigenous knowledge and decision making because we know that it contributes to our collective understanding of the natural world and it enables us to make better decisions and make better policy. Um, so as the department continues to implement President Biden's Investing in America agenda, we're making sure that the indigenous worldviews are um, at our decision-making tables, including with indigenous women and girls whose knowledge of the community and environmental needs is indispensable in designing and implementing culturally appropriate solutions. Um, incorporating indigenous knowledge and decision-making also empowers communities to participate in stewardship of their land and domestically as a cornerstone of President Biden's environmental policies. 
Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, created the first ever Secretary's Tribal Advisory Committee so that tribal leaders could have direct and consistent contact and communication with the department on issues, including how we can incorporate indigenous knowledge. Um, at the USGS, which is a focus of the work I do, there have been long-standing relationships with tribes. Um, one recent initiative through the National Climate Adaptation Science Centers is a webinar series on how we can integrate indigenous knowledge into federal research and research and resource management programs. Um, the series centered on indigenous voices to explore ethical, legal, and scientific considerations for working within different knowledge systems and provides guidance reflecting best practices. So if you're interested in those, they're all recorded and available online in a really interesting um, compilation of how we can start thinking more deeply about this from indigenous communities. A specific example out of the Pacific Islands Climate Adaptation Science Center that is really exciting um, is an effort led in part by Hawaiian women to understand and how original inhabitants of the Hawaiian Islands responded to droughts by exploring traditional texts, newspapers, and Hawaiian language chants. And these efforts, of course, go broader than the Interior Department. Uh, we're working with Department of Agriculture on similar things. The White House also issued a memorandum that commits to elevating indigenous knowledge in federal scientific and policy processes. Um, and on a personal note, since you mentioned the historic nature of Secretary Holland's nomination, um, personally, I'm really proud to be part of the Biden-Harris administration, which has such a historic number of women in high-level government roles, including my boss, Assistant Secretary Trujillo, and her boss, Secretary Holland, who's an indigenous woman, and her Pueblo community is traditionally matriarchal. Thanks. Really, truly inspiration. We had a chance to interact with the secretary at the UN Water Conference. And I would say one of our biggest takeaways as the Women in Water Diplomacy Network was the opportunity to engage and partner with indigenous leaders across this network, uh, across this region as well. Uh, I, Governor Stephen Rowe Lewis um, brought this important uh, phrase to our discussions, teaching us uh, their experience in forcing inclusion. And I think that really put a, kind of a name to a lot of the work that we're doing in the network. It's no one is doing, get, making space uh, without efforts and efforts to expand the, the dialogue and the decision making table. Um, Fumin, uh, I'm going to turn back to you. We're clearly running out of time. Uh, we're hoping to have yet one question, but uh, Kaylee's giving me the hard pass. Uh, I would like you all to join us after this event concludes and bring your questions to our panelists uh, and between yourselves in a small reception we'll have outside. So don't forget your questions. Uh, we just have too much to say. Uh, Fumin. Um, I'd love to hear how you're bringing your experience of, you know, the director of the Kabul River Basin Authority to your new role in Canada, and how uh, your experience and priorities uh, is is translated to your to your new role. What policy initiatives you're excited about in Canada? Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, fortunately, in Canada and South Nation Conservation, uh, we don't deal with the transboundary water management. But the South Nation watership is so near to the U.S. And as far as I know, there are a uh, joint committee between the two countries that work uh, well together and eventually information, uh, something that really happened in Afghanistan and Central Asia. And, uh, uh, in my new career, uh, we've, I faced a new problem, like uh, floods. Uh, during the climate change, uh, uh, floods uh, occur most in the, this region. And uh, because of the sharing basin with the U.S. and the uh, uh, and with uh, uh, Canada, we most know about the data, about the uh, flow, about everything that appear in the shaded river basin. And after that, we can plan uh, a strategy for uh, or master plan for river basin. So in this career, I most focus on sharing data, give the data, and after that, we can uh, make a watershed plan to secure 
to have a secure plan for people and uh, reduce the uh, uh, um, reduce the impact of the flood on people. Uh, now I work on this and I, I love this because I also I'm a scientist and also I'm a um, water diplomat so I can make this together and uh, um, improve and develop a good strategy. Fantastic. And you can really see the passion for water across the faces of all of our panelists, including yourself, Fuman. Um, Tanya Trujillo, I'm going to wrap up with you because you started off giving us a good message around supporting youth engagement. And I just would like if you could share why this is, again, so important and give some inspiration to some of the young people here. Uh, well, thank you, Elizabeth, and thank you to all the panelists for the inspiring messages. I think a lot of us have similar themes in what we've been able to say, and I think one of them is the fact that water does unite us and is able to bring people together and bring women together. And so I am very encouraged and inspired by the next generation who's coming coming uh, behind us and really wish everyone well with the ongoing work that you're doing. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we've obviously gone over a few minutes. Thank you as well to all the participants online and uh, to our amazing panel. Round of applause. <laughs> And uh, I'll invite uh, Kaylee back up to give us a closing remark. I will keep it brief, don't worry. Um, this is just uh, a thanks again for the panelists and also our co-organizers, including Elizabeth, who put in some Herculean effort to make this happen. Um, we're very pleased you're here with us, and we hope to welcome you again back to USIP in the near future. For now, um, I invite everyone to join us outside of the auditorium for some refreshments and treats, uh, another networking opportunity for the great water and, uh, and women uh, diplomats here tonight. Thank you.